Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. This is Teresa with The Intentional Classroom, and today we are going to tackle the difference between sebaceous glands and pseudoriferous glands. So why did I choose to do this? Well, the reality is, as I hear from people all over the place, that their schools don't really cover a lot of skincare, and then they get to their state board, and suddenly they have a very slim understanding of the functions and the structure of the skin. So I'll be totally honest, this is also not my forte, however, I've done enough and I've done enough research and I've talked to enough people to be able to present you some information that you probably need to know for your state board. So, um, so bear with me, I've got some new technology. I thought this would be a good try, you know, a, good, a little short video to try some of this stuff out. And I don't have a video on right now in terms of my face, but I feel like the more important information here is making sure we understand the basis glands, deuteriferous glands, and all of the greatness that, that that is for our body, okay? So both of these are glands of the skin. So what does that mean? Why do we need them? And which is which? Because, you know, they both start with S's. And as per how it tends to be, um, they tend to try to make us as confused as possible. So let's call them things that sound similar, right? We're going to start with sebaceous glands today. So a sebaceous gland is your oil gland. Okay, so the function of the sebaceous gland is to produce oil, or sebum, which is like a fatty lipid type substance, okay? Now you might be thinking, ew, I don't want fat all over my body. True story, but the reality is, is we do need some of that oil to kind of keep us looking young and to kind of prevent our hair and our skin from aging, okay? So the purpose of the sebaceous gland is to moisturize or lubricate the skin, all right? It's really there to make sure that our skin looks supple, that our hair doesn't start to turn brittle. So we need that moisture. We need that oil to be secreted through these glands so that our we keep looking young, right? Because that's what we all want. Where are they? Well, they are located everywhere but the palms and the soles of your feet, okay? So the palms of your hand, the soles of your feet. You will not find sebaceous glands there. So you might get sweaty palms at times if you get nervous, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes, but you're not gonna get sweaty palms. The only reason your palms would be greasy is because you ate some delicious french fries and you got that grease on your hands. That's it, okay? So we don't find sebaceous glands on the palms and soles. That is often a state board question. They'll ask you something like, you know, where um, sebaceous glands are found everywhere, but where, okay? Palms of your hands and soles of your feet. The home address of your sebaceous glands is actually in your dermis. So if you've watched my three layers of the skin video, um, that was it was a while back that I did that one. There are three layers of the skin. You have the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous layer. Um, the dermis is actually made of two layers, the reticular layer and the papillary layer. And the sebaceous layer, or the sebaceous gland is actually found in the reticular layer, okay? Um, additional functions of the sebaceous gland, besides keeping us looking young, is that it provides a waterproof layer to the skin, right? We don't want easy access. If we're standing outside in the rain, we don't want that rain to like go into our body and flood us, right? So the sebaceous layer kind of or gland provides this very light film of oil on our skin to protect us, okay? It also, worth mentioning, combines with the sweat from the pseudoriferous gland to produce something called the acid mantle. So this is something we can probably do an entire video on. The acid mantle lays on our skin. You cannot see it. It's a transparent layer but that is a combination of the, the oil from the sebaceous glands and the sweat from the pseudoriferous glands. Okay, so there's about seven disorders of the sebaceous glands that you really need to know um, for your exam. And I know this is the stuff that you're like, I hate learning these. We all do, okay, we all do. But the reality is, is you do need to know it for your test. So my biggest advice to you for any of these disorders is to flashcard it up and get on Quizlet, write them out yourself, whatever's gonna work for you you really need to spend some time memorizing the, the disorders, okay? So the seven disorders of the sebaceous glands that are likely to show up on your test, um, I'm just going to touch on these guys because we could do this for an hour and nobody wants to hear me talk about disorders for an hour, okay? We start with comedones. These are blackheads. I tend to fight them in my nose, like, like an obsession for me to be able to clean out my blackheads. Um, so you might have comedones on your nose or elsewhere on your face. Milia are little white heads. So if you see some type of pap or a pustule with a little white head to it, that could be milia. Okay? These all have to do with the sebaceous glands, just remember. Then you have acne, which is actually a chronic inflammation of your sebaceous glands. So acne is not just having a bunch of pimples, guys. It's actually an inflammation of the gland. So 
it's way deeper than just having a dirty face, okay? It really has nothing to do with that. It's that your sebaceous glands are overproducing because they're chronically inflamed, okay? Mastiatosis is dry skin, so your sebaceous glands are not producing enough oil. Seborrhea is oily skin, so this means that your sebaceous glands are overproducing, okay? Steatoma is a fatty cyst or a tumor, okay? And then a furuncle, which is just fun to say, like furry uncle, maybe. Um, uh, also, there's a bear in some circle. Um, a furuncle is also known as a boil, okay? So these are all things that you, that are associated with your sebaceous glands. So just some things to memorize as you prep for that state exam, okay? Then we get into pseudoriferous. So pseudoriferous is actually about sweat. So it's your sweat glands. Like this is where, what produces that sweat that comes out of our body, okay? Why do we need to sweat? Well, it's about maintaining body temperature. So I am notoriously a sweaty girl. Uh, my now husband, because I got married a couple of weeks ago, will laugh because it will be 25 degrees out and I'm sweating. He's like, how are you sweating? It's you, it's 30 degrees outside and you're sweating because my body temperature needs to be regulated. Okay. That's my real life. So the location of your pseudoriferous glands are everywhere. So unlike the sebaceous glands that there's some places we don't find them, not true for pseudoriferous glands. You find them everywhere on your body. Okay. The home and address, just like sebaceous glands is in the dermis again, in that reticular layer. And again, worth mentioning it combines the sweat from the pseudoriferous glands, combines with the sebum from the sebaceous glands and produces that acid mantle. Okay, so there are two types of pseudoriferous glands. Now, as a cosmetology student, there's a really good chance you won't actually learn about these two types of pseudoriferous glands because they rarely show up on a test. However, I do recognize that some of the people watching those videos may actually be skincare students. They might be aesthetic students. So I thought we should at least introduce them, even though I will likely pr like pronounce them wrong. Okay. So the two glands, we have the eccrine gland. This is actually the gland that regulates your body temperature. Remember, this is one of your pseudoriferous glands. Okay. This regulates your body temperature. It's controlled by the sympathetic nervous system and removes heat from our body through perspiration. So when we're sweating because it's too hot out or we're sweating because of fitness or whatever it might be, that's the eccrine gland. The apocrine gland, probably pronounced wrong, actually releases a fatty sweat, which is ill, right? So I had to find some Jimmy Fallon for that ill because this is something that causes emotional sweat, all right? This is concentrated in our underarms and our genital area, and it's stimulated by hormonal activity. So this could be something like, you're turned on or you're nervous because you're meeting somebody like this is an emotional thing, right? This unfortunately does release an odor because who doesn't want fatty sweat that smells coming from your down parts? I mean, this is life. This is welcome to skincare. Okay. <clears throat> That's enough of that. Let's talk about just the four simple pseudoriferous gland disorders. So there's probably more than this, but these are the four that will appear on a state exam. The first being bromhydrosis. This is a stinky sweat. So I always kind of like BO, bromhydrosis, they kind of, you know, they will start with the B. This is stinky sweat. So if you are somebody who tends to work out and you get really stinky, you probably have some form of bromhydrosis. Anhydrosis is that you don't sweat enough. Now this is a problem because you could seriously overheat if your body is not releasing perspiration like it needs to, okay? So anhydrosis means your pseudoriferous glands aren't producing enough sweat. Hyperhydrosis, is when you sweat too much. So I probably have a mild form of this because I am a sweaty monster. Um, so hyperhidrosis, your body produces too much sweat. So if you're somebody who you tend to get very sweaty underarms, um, I know dermatologists nowadays will actually use Botox to treat this. They'll stunt the gland so that it doesn't produce so much sweat. That's hyperhidrosis. Remember, hyper always means too much of something. When you're hyperactive, if you have too much energy, hyperhidrosis means too much hydrosis too much sweat. Okay. And the last one is miliaria rubra. Miliaria rubra, if you are from the South or you've ever gotten that heat rash from being out for too long, basically what's, ha what's happened is you've damaged those pseudoriferous glands. And so you get a rash from overheating and that's miliaria, ru miliaria rubra. It's really fun to say. Uh, my cosmetology teacher used to do like a Spanish song and dance with it because she thought it sounded like, like she should I don't know, probably be offensive in some way, honestly, but that's malaria rubra. Okay. 
So these are the four disorders that you'll see kind of associated with the pseudoriparous glands. That's actually all I have for you guys today. So a really quick video to kind of talk about the two different types of glands, help you understand what does what, where they both live and the function of them and why we need those glands. As usual, if you liked today's video, I know it was a little bit different as I've kind of tried out some new stuff. Don't forget to subscribe and share with anyone you think it can help. I really appreciate all the growth that I've seen this year from you all helping me get there. Um, and again, if you have any concerns or questions or comments, throw them into the comments, um, reach out. I'd love to hear from you and I will keep producing some videos and I hope to see you guys soon. All right. Have an awesome day.